Hello students of statics, this is Dr. Dan Baker, and in today's video we're going to talk about slipping versus tipping, which is a friction topic, and we're going to use this topic also to talk about, in general, failure modes, or you can also think about failure modes as in ways something could move or ways something could fail. Okay, so the anecdote that we'll talk about is that let's say that your grandmother um, wills you, gives you her 1989 Ford Taurus wagon. Now, this is one of the finest cars come out of the late 80s. Uh, plenty of room for all your friends. You can sleep in the back. Um, just the perfect car to haul all your stuff to college, right? So as you get this car, you decide you want it to test out what it's really made of, right? You want to figure out how fast you can go, exactly what this car can do. And so you decide to, um, as an engineer, you want to test some things out, okay? So let's say that you take it out on the highway and hypothetically at 104 miles per hour that your left front tire is going to fall off the rim and you're basically going to come to a screeching, um, smoking, sparking halt, okay? But the motor in this car could go all the way up to 150 miles per hour before the pistons would seize to the cylinder walls and you would throw a rod, it would um, shoot oil all over the place, all sorts of smoke. Um, hopefully you can come to rest or come to stop in a safe place. All right, so two failure modes. We have the left front tire coming apart at 104 miles an hour. We have the motor blowing up at 150 miles per hour. Which of these two do you think will happen first? Now, it should be pretty obvious. There's no way that you can jump to 150 miles an hour without passing 104 miles an hour. Okay, so the mode in which this car is going to fail is going to be that left front wheel coming apart at 104 miles an hour. Okay, so the parallel we're going to make with this to slipping or tipping is based upon that whatever type of motion will happen first, either a box or a block will slip first or it will tip first, will control its motion. Okay, so what we need to do fundamentally for these kind of computations is make an assumption. You assume it's going to slip or assume it's going to tip, solve that problem out, and then make the counter assumption, solve that problem out, compare your answers, and see which one would happen first. So to demonstrate this idea of slipping versus tipping, I created this interactive. And so this interactive has a box. You can actually control the weight here of this box. Now you'll notice in this scenario with a horizontal surface or as near to horizontal as I can get it, that I have my normal force and my weight force equal to one another, right? You can see here normal force 15 pounds, weight force 15 pounds. The normal force also exactly lines up with weight force, right? Horizontal surface. Let's go ahead and change the box angle. Okay, so we change the box angle. What you can see happening is the normal force starts to shift. Okay, and so we start shifting this normal force over, in this case, a little bit to the right of center. Also notice that the friction force is increasing. Okay, the friction force is growing. Now, if additionally, I want to up the ante, I want to add a pushing force. Okay, the pushing force is going to happen over here through the location, this P location. And so notice what happens now with the friction and normal force. My friction force needs to get bigger and bigger to resist the additional force that is parallel to that surface. The normal force is moving further and further right. Now, at some point here, and let me actually back off this pushing force. Notice that we went from static but not impending Okay, so here at this point, we have plenty of friction. Here's my maximum friction, 11.79 pounds. If we exceed the 11.79, we're going to go into slipping case. Okay, we would need 14.38 pounds. We do not have that available, which is past our impending motion there. Okay, so if you want something to slip, one thing you can do is to decrease your friction coefficient, right? So if you grease up this surface, you pretty much can be assured that this box will slip versus tip. If you make the surface really sticky, um, you're going to increase the likelihood of tipping. Now at tipping, what's gonna happen here, let me increase this pushing force. The normal force is getting closer and closer to the corner, still perpendicular to the surface. Boom, 
when that normal horse hits the corner, but the friction is not yet at impending motion, we are tipping. Now let me see here, did we actually slip first? Let me jack this all the way up. Ooh, it did just barely slip. I, I noticed that my value's there. Um, we slipped right before we hit that corner. What happens if I move this force up? Boom. Then I'm going to require the normal force to move further to the right. Okay, so a bunch of in different interactions here. Interactions with the location of the pushing force, the magnitude of the pushing force, the friction coefficient. So realize that fundamentally, once the normal force goes past the corner, we are going to be into a tipping type situation. I can bring that back in inside the corner by lowering there my pushing force. Okay, and so you could do the same thing if you um, tilt, tilted this the other way. Now, in this case, it's going to be a whole lot harder to make it tip, right? So even if I increase my sub s all the way up to 1 and put my pushing force clear up to the corner, I'm still not, oh, I can get it to tip, but only at um, a pretty high value of my pushing force. And as I drop this very rapidly, it's going to come back down um, into static but not impending. Okay, so one thing you'll notice as you play with this interactive is there's a whole bunch of cases where things are static but not impending, and only a handful where we are either slipping or tipping. Okay, so static but not impending is like your safest design case. You're not at the edge of anything, okay, where impending motion is fundamentally at the edge between, between things moving and not moving. And so if you are designing something and you want to have a really good idea of exactly whether it's going to be moving or not moving, put it into static but not impending, not at impending motion, right? Impending motion allows you to figure out your bookends, figure out those extreme um, edges where things are about to move. Okay, so the fundamental things that we learned with this interactive, now you can simulate all of these computations, and that's actually what's happening in the background um, of this problem. But honestly, it's looking at summing forces in the x direction, summing forces in the y direction. Now, I'll, I'll leave it up to you whether you decide to rotate axes or not. To be honest, a problem like this one, Now, I'll leave it up to you if you decide to rotate your axes or not. To be honest with you, on a problem like this one, it's probably going to be best to rotate your axes. So say your x-axis is along the surface and your y-axis is rotated 90 degrees from that. And the reason for that is that only your weight force would be in kind of a standard horizontal vertical axis system. So I'm really just often looking for what would give me the least amount of components to deal with. So let's go ahead and set up an example, and I can show you how to compare your computations between an assumed slip and an assumed tipping case. And it's actually geometry-wise is going to look a whole lot like this. We're going to move our p-force down to about one half of the overall height. All right. So here is our box, and we are pushing on it here from the side with a force. P and this um, box is sitting on a surface and the surface is 15 degrees from horizontal. We have a weight force acting through the centroid. Let's assume this weight force is 100 newtons and we have a known mu sub s is equal to 0 0.3. The geometry of this box, it is one meter wide and two meters tall. Okay, one meter wide, two meters tall, weighs 100 newtons, and we're pushing half of its height. All right, so let's go ahead and we're gonna assume slip. Okay, so if we assume slip. And so by assuming slipping, we are assuming that that normal force has not reached the corner, okay? So here is my normal force. My weight force is still acting here through the center. My friction force is opposing the motion coming back along the surface to the left. And I'm gonna use a rotated axis so that my friction and normal and pushing forces will all be lined up with the X or Y axes and only my weight force won't. And I could come in here and show that 
that 15 degrees manifests itself as a 15 degrees. So the weight's still vertical, but it's 15 degrees there from the y axis. All right. So with this assumed slipping case, I can sum my force in the x direction. And here I have, now I'm going to label this P1 and P2. Um, and P1 is going to be for slipping and P2 is going to be for tipping. Okay. So I have that pushing force, P1. I have my friction force. Now again here, let's go ahead and label this F sub 1. So P1 and F1 for slipping. And then I have in the negative X direction down the slope, it's going to be the sine of that weight force, right? W sine of 15 degrees, this is equal to zero. And then if I sum my forces in the Y direction, I have all of my normal force, right? Which is going to be N. And then I'm subtracting off a component of my weight force, it's going to be the, the cosine component, minus W cosine of 15 degrees, all of this equal to zero. Now we know that the weight was 100 newtons. Newtons is a weight force. Therefore, I should put a sub, sub one on this one as well. We can find the N sub one is equal to 96.6 newtons. Because we are assuming slip, we can therefore assume that F is equal to mu sub s times N. Okay, so we can use that mu sub s of 0.3. And so we can find that F sub 1 is equal to 30% of the normal, which gives us 28.98 newtons. And then we could substitute that back into our sum of the force in the X equation and find that P1 is equal to 54.8. 86 newtons. Okay, so this box will slip at 54.86 newtons given this geometry. Now, notice in these equations I did not solve, but there is one more unknown here, which is the distance x over to that normal force. Okay, and so I could have solved for that, and I would actually would solve for a sum of moments in order to find that value of x. All right, so that was assuming slip. Let's go ahead and assume tip. And so if we're assuming tipping, our free body diagram is going to look quite a bit the same. Pushing force. We have our weight force. But we're going to move our normal force all the way over to that corner. Okay, and then the friction force acting down along the surface, so there is F. And again here, if we're assuming tip, we are assuming that F is less than mu sub S times N. Now, if you have a less than, you can't use that as an equation. Okay, you can only use an equality as an equation, right? Those two words go together, equality and equation. All right, so we are going to again rotate our axes, and so this will be the X. This will be the y. Now, our sum of force equations are going to look exactly the same, okay? Because we haven't changed the fundamental direction of any of these forces. So, summing forces in the x direction, we have now this is going to be p2, f2, and n2. Now, I'm labeling them as sub twos just so we can see if there's any difference. We're not assuming that they're the same value across the two different motion types. Okay, so summing force in the x, we have p2 in the positive x, we have f2 in the negative x, and then we have again the w sine of 15 degrees is equal to zero. As we sum our forces in the y direction, we still have our normal force n2, we have the cosine component of our w, w cosine of 15, and this still equals zero. So it turns out that n2 also equals 96.6 newtons. And so the normal force is not affected by either slipping or tipping. Now, if I change the angle of P2, then that would start to interact with N2. Okay, but because P2 and N2 are independent, it doesn't matter if we have a different value of P2 or P1, we'll get the same N. All right, now we're going to sum moments. And I am going to sum my moments. And you have to think kind of carefully about this. There's no right or wrong place to sum moments, but you want to pick somewhere that your geometry is going to be as friendly as possible. Okay, so on this particular problem, I chose the centroid 
point G. And one of the reasons I chose the centroid is that we talked about P was halfway up. Right, so I know that P is on a line of action to go through point G. I also can very easily find my vertical distance down to F2, looking at that moment, and my horizontal distance up to the line of action of N2. Okay, so that's why I chose the centroid point there, point G. So summing moments about point G, my centroid, I have the following moments. First of all, I have a moment from the friction force. Okay, so this is negative from the right-hand rule. Negative times one meter times F2. Okay, next up I have the normal force. Half of the width of this one meter box I have positive 0 0.5 meters times N2. Now I don't have any moments from P2 or W because those go right through point G. And so this is equal to zero. And I end up with an equation that tells me that F2 is equal to 0 0.5 times N2. And therefore I can find by substituting back into my previous equations that P2 is equal to 74.18 Newtons. Now, one thing that I think is really interesting about this problem, for one, we solved for our pushing force, P, two different ways, right? We solved for it with assumed slipping, and we found this value up here, 54.86. We also found that P2, if we assume tipping, would need to be 74.18. So comparing these two results, we find out that P2 is greater than P1. Therefore, this box will never get to P2, which is the tipping condition, because it will hit P1 at, and at the slipping condition first. So we could say that the box therefore slips instead of tips. It turns out that you can also reach slipping or tipping technically at the exact same point. Okay, if your geometry is just right and the forces are just right. And the value for mu sub s to reach slipping and tipping at the exact same point turns out to be 0 0.5. Now, that 0.5 didn't come from mu sub s in this lower equation. It just came from the ratio of half of the width to half of the height. But do notice here in this equation, right, this looks a whole bunch like f is equal to mu sub s times n. And so we could put a little note down here at the bottom that we could say that at mu sub s is equal to 0 0.5, the box slips and tips at the same p. And if you wanted to find that result, it turns out that you could basically put in 0.5 instead of 0 0.3 into the top equation. Now, I didn't put in here explicitly, but let me go ahead and show you where that would come in. That would come in right here, right? We put in 0 0.3 times N1 for our friction force because it was an impending motion because we were assuming it was going to slip. But if you put in a 0 0.5 and you solved out for P1, you would actually get 74.18, okay? The exact same um, value of P for slipping and tipping. So you can reach these fundamentally at the same time. It's pretty rare and the numbers have to line up perfectly. So that is this concept over slipping or tipping. Now, there are going to be some problems you'll likely work that maybe tipping isn't an issue, but maybe there's multiple planes of slipping. And so you're still going to address these the same way, that you're going to make assumptions and you're going to check if your assumptions are correct. Um, and so just basically set up multiple free body diagrams, set up multiple equations of equilibrium, and find some parameter that you can check. And often these parameters are either going to be like a driving force here like P, or sometimes they'll actually be an angle. Okay, so maybe you're varying this angle theta and it's not going to be fixed at 15 degrees, but that can be kind of another driving factor. And you can and you could figure out, well, at what angle would it slip or at what angle would it tip? And then the controlling angle would be the smaller of those two. Thank you so much for your attention today.